faculty, staff, and class of 2019, welcome to today's ceremony and congratulations, and a special greeting to the families of our graduates. And of course, the biggest congratulations go to our students. You have the special distinction of being the 50th graduating class from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. When Mount Sinai welcomed its first medical school class, most of our lecture halls and science labs were in a converted bus depot. There was no Hess building, no Annenberg building, and where the Guggenheim Pavilion now sits was an old hospital from the late 1800s. I was a member of the second medical school class. How did I get here? I had a friend who was in the first class, and he encouraged me to apply. Where else, he said, could you find a medical school with then, believe it or not, only 40 students in the class? A school so small that every student really mattered. A school where the administration was not distracted by a law school, a graduate school, or an undergraduate campus. A school where teaching medicine came first. So like you, I applied and became a member of this medical school. 50 years later, there are thousands of graduates from our school, and we've added a graduate school. It too has thousands of alumni. And our spaces are a lot more comfortable than they were in the bus depot. 50 years ago, our political dialogue, the political dialogue that I was a part of, was consumed by the war in Vietnam. Today, healthcare is the center of our political debate. Polls show that healthcare is the number one issue on people's mind as we approach next year's election. As you see, it's impossible to go a day without reading about healthcare in the news or debating it online or hearing about it on TV. You graduates will soon be the epicenter of this debate. Hard decisions will have to be made. Decisions forced upon us by the macroeconomics of healthcare as almost a fifth of our, G of our GDP is consumed by spending on healthcare. Far more than any other country on the planet an expenditure that is becoming increasingly unaffordable. Unaffordable for federal and state governments, unaffordable for employers and employees, and unaffordable to individuals and families. It is said that if the trajectory of healthcare spending does not change, it will bankrupt the country. And we know it is already bankrupting some families. It is our job to bring to this debate the nuances and facts that we as physicians, academicians, and researchers see every day. Class of 2019, I implore you to join the debate and make sure the conversations we're having in our hospitals, in our communities, and across the country are honest and factual. Please help others recognize there are no simplistic solutions to this tough problem. One of the most critical questions we face is about coverage. How do we ensure that we provide health care to everyone, everyone in this country? And everyone truly means everyone, a concept I am sure the vast majority of people in this room accept. But the ability to achieve universal coverage starts with a discussion of how we can make health care more affordable. And for those discussions, too often, there is, it is neither thorough nor sophisticated. Let me give you some examples. Let's start with this simple question. Does being poor make you sick? I'm oversimplifying, but the stark reality is that a substantial number of outcomes in medicine are determined by social factors. What I mean are things like this. Living in an apartment with mold and fungus can make you sick. Living without healthy food or clean water can make you sick. Living without a working elevator can make you sick. We have seen firsthand that these socioeconomic factors are a powerful force that often lead to poor outcomes and raise healthcare costs for our whole country. Among the developed countries in the world, we, the United States, spend significantly less on social services than other Western democracies. We simply do not make the investment as a country that the rest of the developed world makes. And as a consequence, they experience lower healthcare costs. Sadly, addressing the social safety net and connecting it to healthcare outcomes and healthcare spending rarely enters the discussion on how to rein in health care costs. Let's consider another example, the outrageous cost of some prescription drugs. Our commencement speaker, 
former FDA commissioner Scott Gottlieb, a graduate of our medical school, sped up the approval of generic drugs. He had the courage to address the drug pricing issue. And we, as fellow graduates of our medical school, are proud of his accomplishments and the policies he set in motion. But the FDA, by law, is limited in what it can do to address the drug pricing problem. Solutions are complicated and extend beyond the boundaries of our country. In every country beside the U.S., their government buys prescription drugs for its citizens and sets the price. This is why people in the rest of the world wind up paying far less for the same drugs than you and I. Consequently, Americans are providing the profit margins pharmaceutical companies need for drug development. But the rest of the world shares all these benefits and gets it for free. So why not make this a cornerstone of trade negotiations with our allies? Say to the world, Americans cannot be the sole supporter of R&D investments in pharma. Why not negotiate trade agreements so that foreign governments raise the prices for their citizens? And then make sure those savings, make sure those savings are passed on to Americans. That leads me to a final point about drug prices, and that's about patent law. Current patent law allows too many drugs that are not very innovative to have long market exclusivity, which is to say have no competition. As it stands, drug makers can make small tweaks to a particular drug and essentially develop a patent-protected new product. Remember the purple pill? It was for those people who know chemistry, it was the L isomer of Prilosec. But patent law should reward invention and innovation, not copycat drugs. We should allow the FDA and commissioners like Scott Gottlieb to determine the extent of market exclusivity based on how innovative a new drug is. And that should be judged against real data produced by pharma showing superiority of their product to existing products. This would create a financial incentive for drug producers to create original products rather than slightly and barely changing something that already exists. We need to encourage innovation, not duplication. But these are nuanced discussions. I'm sure that those of you who are following these debates have not come across a discussion of patent law, trade policy, and the social safety net. However, going forward, many of you will be drawn into these discussions if you already have not. When you are, be proactive, offer nuanced solutions. Present facts, not ideology. Don't allow simple answers to threaten what we hold most dear, a better future for our patients. So, congratulations on reaching this momentous day. I wish you the best of luck and know you'll make our health system better. Thank you.